Okay, hello and welcome everybody to another wonderful episode of Good News in Parks. We are super happy to have you here with us today. Um, and we wanted to answer a couple of questions that we have received from you on the CEU process um, for the show, just so that everybody understands how that works. So after the show, um, you'll receive a survey, which when filled out and submitted serves as your evidence of completion. Then uh, after you submit that finished survey, the certificate is emailed to the email address that you registered with. So just as a tip, um, if one person registers and logs on and others join to watch that person's screen in a meeting room, only the person who registers is going to get the CEU. So if CEUs are something that you're interested in, be sure to register and watch from a separate terminal. Terminal, And honestly, you can turn it on on your terminal and then go watch in the other room, but <laughs> unless your terminal actually registers that you um, have logged into the show, you won't get that survey afterwards. Also, be sure to check your spam folders for the survey and the certificate of completion. We've had a few instances of that occurring. Um, and then finally, it may take a day for the survey to arrive and up to three days for the certificates to be returned after the survey is submitted. Um, just due to the volume of all of you guys out there with CEU requests, so we appreciate that, but please be a little patient if you don't get those immediately. And then finally, remember that you have to watch live to earn CEUs, the pre-recorded versions of the show aren't eligible. We also want to remind you to be a part of our live session today by using the Q&A button in the Zoom control panel to ask our guests questions. And we'll try to get to as many of them as we can during the show today. We have another really exciting panel of directors to share insights with you today. So I'm going to turn it over to my co-host Jody Adams to introduce them and share some news updates with you all. Jody, take it away. Thank you, Emory. We are extremely excited with this panelist today. Let me go ahead and let's introduce them before I do good news, national news. First of all, Mitchell Silver. He's the commissioner of New York Department of Parks and Recreation in New York, New York. He also has been recognized as an international award-winning planner for more than 35 years and is the immediate past president of the American Planning Association. He also was elected to the Planium list of 100 most influential urbanists in 2017 and named an honorary member of the American Society of Landscape Architects in 2017, also an honorary member of the, Ameri uh, the Academy of Science in 2016, and obviously has received numerous other awards gl with global organizations throughout the career. We are so excited to have you, Mitchell. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. You bet. Homer Garza, Director of the City of San Antonio, Texas Parks and Recreation Department, with an extensive background in conservation and environmental stewardship. He has served on the Conservation Advisory Panel for NRPA. In addition to, he's also served on NRPA host committees. Thank you, Homer. He served on various capacities and he has served the Texas Recreation and Park Society and Local Government of Hispanic Networks. Welcome, Homer. Thank you very much. It's a, pr a privilege to be with everyone today. You betcha. And Bob Lowe, Director of Springfield Green County Park Board, directs a department that is both CAPRA accredited agency and is a gold medal award grand plaque recipient, past president of Missouri Parks and Recreation Association, and Bob also serves as owner representative on Springfield Lasers professional tennis team with the World Team Tennis Professional Sports League. Bob, welcome and great to see you today. Hey Jody, good to be with you and all of our panelists here. Be a fun morning. You betcha. Fun day ahead, everyone. Here we go with our national news. Shout out to Kevin Roth, Vice President of NRPA for Research and Learning. I, I can just tell you right now, Kevin has just posted the February 2nd through the 5th of the actual happenings that are going on within our departments and our field through the survey, national survey of NRPA. Shout out to the heroes and heroes that are responding to the pandemic, which some of them we have as our guests today. Intelligent, creative, and collaborative efforts going on right now. Here are the top items that some of the departments are doing right now. They're setting up vaccine centers 
and the staff is now sta actually staffing those centers. They're providing facilities with laptops for Wi-Fi for children and, and underserved communities to access school assignments and park and recreation staff is also supervising these children. They're training their lifeguards to administer the rapid test. Oh, wow. Uh, that's extension of, of their, uh, their backgrounds. That's great, great learning. And finally, providing 24 hours of outdoor hygienic stations, portable toilets, hand washing stations, and round the clock security for areas of parking lots and unused athletic fields for the homeless. So again, supporting society in general, wonderful. Wanted to remind everybody, the gold medal application is out right now. It's gonna be due. So you want to go ahead, if you want to apply for the gold medal, go to nrpa.org or the American Academy of Parks and Recreation Administration uh, .org, and that will, uh, the application will be there. And then I wanna also mention some great training ahead. We have some great training for NRPA and the American Academy on February 16th. You will actually see, and here's the title, COVID-19 pandemic and vaccine, apply the equity lens and it is free of charge. So please go to those websites. Also, I wanna mention that we have a great uh, Pennsylvania Parks and Recreation Society is gonna offer 20 tips for the accidental marketer. Now we all know that we can use any help there. And that will be, uh, go to prps.org. And then finally, I wanna move into this and this will move us and dovetail into our first question. As recognition from Black History Month, want to recognize Ernest T. Atwell. From 1920 to 1945, Mr. Atwell was the director of the Bureau of Colored Work Programs for the United States. He, participate, he partnered with the War Camp Community Service Program and pioneered the creation of leadership training programs for African Americans throughout our nation to organize classes, supervise playgrounds, and move into leadership roles in recreation community centers all through the country. Today, the American Academy of Parks and Recreation and the NRPA, National Recreation uh, Park Association, plus the National Recreation and Park Ethnic Minority uh, Society is offering two externships to any professional 35 and under to attend the NRPA Congress this year and that is a ongoing scholarship that's offered out there. So young professionals that have tapped in, we have several hundred colleagues on this actual uh, show today. Please tap into this and I wanna thank Rosalind Johnson and Shania, uh, Sana uh, Shaw for sharing that information with me today. So thanks again. Now with that intro of information, let's move into our first question. Okay, gentlemen, here we go. As we recognize February is Black History Month nationwide, how is your department and city recognizing and celebrating Black History Month? Mitchell, let's have you kick us off today. I am so proud to say that we have a very extensive program here this year, close to 20 programs, both with parks and our park partners. I'll just highlight four, uh, which are ones that I Hope people will check out even virtually because some of them are virtual. We have a visitor center called Pole Park and that's in the Bronx. And we'll be having a virtual exhibit to really showcase artists and the black experience. So that's really throughout the whole month from the 1st to the 28th. So that is virtual and I'll give you the website when I'm done. We're also gonna have a special feature on Seneca Village. For those that don't know, Seneca Village was a predominantly black owned community that was within the footprint of Central Park. Through eminent domain, they were moved out and Central Park was built. So the Central Park Conservancy in honor of the contributions they made and those residents that live there, again, it was a black owned uh, property mm -hmm. primarily owned by uh, African-Americans uh, that had to move. And so they're going through a commemoration of where they're located, not too far from the Museum of Natural History, if all of you have seen those movies. And so they're gonna recognize their contributions. 
Uh, there's another one which I'll be moderating. Uh, we have named a number of our parks and park assets after uh, Black Americans and Black New Yorkers. I'll be interviewing the family members of some of those parks that have been renamed after prominent African Americans. And so that's on February 24th, that will be virtual. And then the last one, which I'm very excited about, our urban park rangers are very active. We'll be highlighting Brooklyn and the Underground Railroad. We just had one of our historic wow. buildings in downtown Brooklyn designated in the historic landmark and believed to be part of the Underground Railroad. So our urban park rangers will be holding this session to talk about Brooklyn and the Underground Railroad. If you wanna find out more about these events and other events, you can go to nyc.gov slash parks, type in Black History Month, and you will see the wealth of activities we're sharing that you can actually participate in virtually. It's been amazing, Mitchell. I did look at it. And oh my gosh, you have a plethora of information there to celebrate the month, but beyond this month. And I think we all need to remind each other, it's a celebration every day. So Mitchell, thank you so much. Homer, let's hear what San Antonio is doing. It's primarily in the form of two methods. One, of course, we have a social media presence like uh, seems everyone does these days. Uh, but also uh, we are fortunate enough to uh, have a small number of our community centers open. Um, of course, with uh, safety uh, being priority number one for the youth that are enrolled in our program, we are highlighting in particular some uh, African-Americans that have been great contributors, both nationally and locally. Uh, and so of course, top of mind, and, and one of the things that we've highlighted in lessons is really having a better understanding of who uh, Kamala Harris is. I mean, we know that uh, mm -hmm. she is vice president, but uh, so that's the here and now, but also looking at, you know, just history, who are some other famous um, African-Americans that we may not everyone would know about. So, uh, because fun facts are good, uh, <laughs> but when they're not right, then they're no longer fun. So I'm gonna look at the chief That's right. here. Uh, but so another one highlighting is uh, Dr. Shirley Jackson, who is a mm -hmm. theoretical physicist, uh, whose claim to fame is developing the touch tone phone and uh, oh. fiber optic cable. Additionally, in my personal favorite, I think, cause you know, highlighting the fun piece of this Lonnie Johnson, who is an aerospace engineer uh, and credited with creating the super soaker. So as I grew up with my kids, I've got super soakers <laughs> at home that we've used uh, to, to create fun memories for ourselves. Um, and then, but beyond that, uh, to Mitchell's point, we do have parks that are named after famous mm -hmm. African-Americans and we are military city USA. And so helping our mm -hmm. children and that are in our programs, but also in our community. And this is where I think social media is critical so that we can extend service delivery beyond our facilities. Uh, and I wanna highlight a couple. One is uh, Robert A. Dawson. So he is a local native San Antonian, but he is uh, the city's first licensed African-American pilot and was trained as a cadet uh, in World War II. Uh, beyond wow. Mr. Dawson, we have Milam Wesley Teeler. He uh, served more than 26 years in the Air Force. So not only uh, giving back to the community, but serving our country. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard to achieve a higher level of service. And he had two tours in Vietnam. So looking really at our parks, highlighting that history so that the people who service them know it, but also the park visitors that come and, and get to create those special moments. So just some highlights and things that we're doing to, to really honor the month. But to your point, Jody, it really goes beyond just today, this month. That's right. It is um, something we do every day. Absolutely. And uh, well, I'll come back to you, definitely, Homer, because uh, you this youth is so important. And we're going to talk about some of that later on. But your youth programs are extensive. It's amazing what you're doing in San Antonio. Bob, what is Springfield Green County doing? Well, Jody, kind of dubious calling Mitchell and Homer and bat third in this lineup. But uh, <laughs> you know what I would say? We had a really unique opportunity here with our, our city county park system just a few years back. We have a historic park, Silver Springs Park, one of our 10 historic parks in the community, but very important to the black community through the years. 
And adjacent to that, we had um, what was called Timmons Temple, a uh, historic church in the Black neighborhood um, that dates back to the 30s. And it was slated for demolition here just a few years back. And we had a group come forward um, in 2013, 2014, just looking to find a permanent home, save a historic structure, save something that was kind of iconic in the community. And that's where we, after a lot of deliberation, money, trying to figure it all out, welcome back into Silver Springs Park. And so now, that happened in 2015, we opened that facility up here just in the last couple of years, but it's a tremendous cultural resource here to the city of Springfield and our area. Um, just this past weekend, we had all, and we went from calling it Timmons Temple to Timmons Hall, but it's a great uh, opportunity there within Silver Springs to just um, allow people to learn, allow people to reflect. Um, this past weekend, we really did celebrate uh, Black History Month here for our park system. We had a uh, noted professor from the University of Missouri Columbia, Dr. Garrett King, come in and talk about rethinking Black history. Um, that great workshop, um, wish we could have had more people on there, but had to space them out. But we live streamed it, we got that up online. And then on Saturday, we uh, premiered at Simmons Hall um, a really neat play called The Assignment, which basically tells the story of a college student who's struggling to complete a project for an African-American studies class. And we put that out there too. And the neat thing about that is that's just not, you know, a February thing here for us. Um, we look to have um, a speaker series opportunities throughout the entire year there at Simmons Hall. Um, have a really dynamic uh, individual leading that program for us, uh, Christine Peoples. Christine works with Springfield Public Schools, our area universities, um, just to showcase what we can do, bring groups into that. The other thing that's happened here just in the last couple of years and I'm, I'm really excited about is what's called the Springfield Green County African American Heritage Trail, which allows us to denote um, things that were iconic areas and special places to the black community through the years link them all up by a trail. And uh, we're excited about that. The first sign that went into the park system was right there at Timmons Hall. Um, so it was just a real celebration for us this past year and look for more good things to come out of that. Thank you, Jody. Well, I just, that Heritage Trail, I can't believe how many people are using that. I'm seeing that all over Facebook and, and everything is, hey, I went out today and we started walking the trail. Great moves, Bob. I'm so happy for Springfield Green County and your progress that you've made there. It's wonderful. All right, gentlemen, let's go to question number two. Availability of sports, sports events, leagues, instructional programs have all been affected by the numerous challenges and following distancing and state and local health guidelines during the pandemic, which has also affected our sports tourism within your communities, regions, and states. Part one. What sports are currently being operated in your park system under the health restrictions and guidelines? The part two, as we move forward, what's your plan to restore the full operations of your sports instructional programs, leagues and events throughout your park system? I can tell you this has come up, several surveys from our attendees and I just wanna mention all these questions are coming from our audience. So again, gentlemen, let me lead into it. And Homer, why don't you take it away? Okay, thank you uh, for the question. So um, from a sports perspective, we have nearly every sport um, that at least is certainly known to us uh, that is operating in some form or fashion. Uh, let me begin by saying our local park system here, uh, we do not uh, run adult rep recreation leagues like we used to. We have a partner, however, that does that, that utilizes public parkland. And so through that partnership, they're able, they're able to provide that recreational opportunity for adults, primarily in the form of softball. Uh, our focus really has been around youth, investments in youth. That was a policy decision made by city council uh, close to a decade ago. And so that's where we started to look at who are partners that can help extend that youth offering while we you know, let others that maybe could do the youth, the, the adult piece better. So within our park system, we have uh, more than two dozen you, um, just youth run organizations, mom and pop type organizations. They're all nonprofits. They mm -hmm. get to provide this uh, recreational opportunity in our parks uh, in exchange for free use of the land. 
So when you think about, you know, we have more than 250 parks, we're the seventh largest city in, in the country, and we can't be everything and do everything to everyone. And that's where partners come in and is so critical, where we do focus um, our efforts are where we run leagues in our facilities. So for example, uh, we have our uh, Spurs basketball league that will be kicking off very soon. Uh, that is very easy for us to fill, very high in demand. They are the uh, course five-time NBA champion. So that's like an easy sell for us. Uh, we have a close partnership with them. Uh, and we also run some other recreational leagues, but all within the confines of our facilities. But when you get beyond that, that's where our partners come in. And one thing I love to highlight most recently when I talk about, you know, cricket in San Antonio uh, yeah. has really <laughs> come to the forefront probably in the last 12 to 24 months. So we have a team of professional cricketers and they're focused on adult cricket, but we're right now in the process of having them provide a youth cricket academy, if you will, to wow. extend that offering. And that's something that if you asked me five years ago, would we be doing it? I would have said probably not, but you don't know what you don't know. And as we that's continue right. to grow our park system, we find these new service offerings. So um, that's it from a sports perspective, really quick on just the larger plan. The city of San Antonio does have a larger uh, four-phased plan for returning back to normal. Of course, phase four is everything's open. Um, so we do have some modified services that we're providing right now. The quickest thing and biggest thing for us to returning to normal uh, back to pre-pandemic is really filling positions. Uh, in order to balance our budget a year ago, there were some really tough decisions made that effectively um, limited our ability to provide services of the community and fill positions that we need to do it. With the current budget, those restrictions are now gone. So we're quickly trying to fill positions as quick uh, as, as soon as possible, really, so that we can get back to that normal sense of normalcy and uh, offer the programming that everyone loves, highlighted by like our cultural programming and dance. And so thinking back to uh, some of you know, the non rec, you know, the non physical piece, right? Being out on a field or a sports court, but what's another form of recreation that we provide? And it's through cultural programming. So we're in the process right now of re envisioning that and, and see how we can extend that and bring it back to the community. Well, I'll tell you, Homer, uh, we've heard echoes of that. You know, it's like um, you've got to ramp up and it's quick ramp, ramp back up and get those employees on, not just part time, but also some full time on that. Bob? Well, Jody, this is the part where I have the disclaimer and mention that you, as, as one of our co-hosts today, and the legacy you have really left our Springfield Green County uh, Park Board with in terms of sports, sports development, um, world-class facilities. Um, we're blessed here with our sports and just what we have with our sports infrastructure. We're one of the few public entities with a professional team, our, our Springfield Lasers World Team Tennis franchise. Um, um, 2018, 2019 WTT champs. I'll get that plug in there. Um, but it's interesting. Um, one of the benefits we had um, going into this was the partnership we have with our Springfield Green County Health uh, Department and working through them every step of the way to make sure we were able to continue to offer sports in, in a safe um, and, and reasonable and, and just health conscious way. And so we've done that partnership from day one looking around the country and kind of seeing the NRPA updates, boy, I felt like we were very fortunate here in the Midwest with not facing some of the issues we had on the coast and, and uh, up in the, you know, up, up on, in the eastern part with just total shutdown. So we were able to work that out. And I think that's it. I think the partnership, the working through um, our, our recreation staff, our sports staff, they've all done a really phenomenal job of working through the logistics of it all to make sure that we've got spacing, we've got numbers accounted for, we're following all the protocols that are in place, um, even using our park rangers for crowd control purposes and making sure we're keeping people, you know, and parents and things like that space where we possibly could. Um, but with that also comes the part about working with your partner groups to make sure they're following suit too. If it's at our facility, if it's in one of our parks, we're still responsible, even though it may be the Youth Athletic Association kind of <laughs> right. running 
we had to kind of follow that and, and just be out there with a support role that way as well. Um, where we haven't, the one area we haven't really gotten back yet is with our, any kind of senior sports programming. We're still just not quite there, but I hope we are in the next month or two, um, as well as with our, our accessible recreation programs and what we do with our Miracle League baseball program. And just still not quite safe yet, but I hope we get that back here for this spring. It's been fantastic for the game of golf here in Springfield. Um, our, we're up 8 to 10%. We didn't have to close, but that's because we jumped in early on which is providing protocols and educating our local leaders and our health department folks on what steps we were doing, we were taking to make sure that it was a safe environment. Last thing I would touch on was just the professional aspect and what we've done. You know, World Team Tennis is one of the first professional sports back um, in the pandemic. They play their season in July. They went into the very first bubble and they did that out in West Virginia at the Green Bar Resort, locked everybody down, forced everybody in two weeks early, played a three week season. Unfortunately, we didn't repeat because that was the goal going in. But, you know, we were there and it was live sports on TV. And if you remember, man, May, June, yes. it's pretty lean time. So it's good to see that happening again. I think we will continue to be in a bubble this year. Perhaps uh, over maybe down your way. We're looking at uh, Texas and maybe even uh, doing something down that way. Again, provide a safe environment uh, for our players, our coaches and uh, a few of our fans. Well, I'll tell you, um, it's been amazing to see what has happened in the game of tennis and golf and, and how they have been able to open up facilities. Mitchell, we've left you for last on purpose. You're dealing with the coast, and let's hear from you. Please take us home on this one. Sure. Well, the, right now, the weather is affecting a lot of our outdoor activities. We are accepting permits for our leagues. Uh, but they all know it's all dependent on the governor's guidance. The governor just gave news uh, yesterday that they're going to open up sporting venues to 10% capacity. So all of our major yeah. sports can fill up by 10% capacity. But everything we do is governed by the governor. And so we here are prepared. Um, everything was closed uh, in terms of all of our outdoor recreation except passive uh, uh, activities and parks. Reopened basically in July and has not closed. So if you want to go out to play soccer, you can. You can still play it right now, not in the league. But all the leagues are aware we're accepting uh, those applications, but we cannot make a determination until we believe it's safe to bring them back. Last year when we did have our leagues, uh, we they had to follow certain protocols. Uh, guardians, parents can come. We couldn't have large crowds, so the youth can still play. Uh, and we allow tennis, all the other sports uh, with certain protocols in place. We ex expect the same to take place this year. Our indoor facilities, our rec centers, they're all closed. Either serving as daycare centers, uh, testing sites, vaccination sites. Uh, we feel that they are not safe at this point to have people that close. But in general, we expect another great sporting season. We were able to open our pools and beaches. It was a little bit different how we trained our lifeguards. They could not do mouth to mouth and had to find other ways to resuscitate someone should yes. they need that support. Uh, so New York, a uh, big, big park, a big city, a lot of, we have 2000 parks. And so we know how important it was during the pandemic for people to get out there. But sports in particular, right now, we're just keeping a close eye on the permits. The mm -hmm. parents are calling, they want to know, because mm -hmm. March <laughs> is when we start <laughs> our fields by mowing, by clay, you know, all that starts <laughs> in March. So we're clearly waiting for the guidance because here, both soccer and youth, uh, Little League, baseball, and even softball, very, very popular. And the rest is basically informal, but that's where we have to have it more structured with our leagues uh, and make sure they file the proper applications and permits. You know, Mitchell, you have just a dynamic system. And I've been very fortunate to have been visiting New York parks for 30 years. And you and I lost a good friend, David Dinkins, Honorable Dave, David Dinkins, last end of last year, who served on the board of USTA with me. I can just tell you right now, he educated me on New York parks. And I just want to say to you, for you to be able to deal with this pandemic has been amazing. I've seen you on three other seminars, and it is tremendous how you have kept your citizens safe but still providing a methodical plan to come back into action. So way to go, Mitchell. Let me just add something very quickly. I'd have to say being a planner by training uh, really came in useful. One, NRPA yes. was an amazing organization. 
But we were always three steps ahead and had three sets of signs, close, <laughs> caution, and then open. And we were ready. So when the mayor or the governor said, do this, we said, the signs have already produced. And how are you doing that so fast? <laughs> the signs are all ready. And so we had all of our assets in different classes. And so I, I, we had no time but just to sit around a war room and figure out of all That's of our 2,000 right. parks with all those features inside. Taking down the rims of basketball, that got a lot of national attention. And then other cities yeah. followed uh, because we people couldn't socially distance. So we took over 2,000 rims down in all of our Wow. Parks. Thank you. Thank you. It was a, a team effort. Yeah, definitely a team effort. But gentlemen, thank you for answering some of these questions because this is really important right now. That has been a burning, burning uh, topic that people wanted to address. Now we are ready for another segment of the show and Anne-Marie, it's poll time. All right, it is poll time. And so we are actually hearing from a lot of you um, in surveys um, that people are saying, you know, People in my park are missing this thing or that thing. Is that like normal across the country? So we thought we would ask you. So here is our question, our first question for today. Um, in a lot of places, only walking paths are open. Um, what other park facilities do your users say they are missing the most right now? Um, and this is multiple choice. So you can vote for all, all that apply. Uh, dog parks, shelters, et cetera, for family gatherings playgrounds, rec centers, swimming facilities, splash parks, organized sports and fields, golf courses, tennis and pickleball courts, or outdoor amphitheaters. Um, so a lot of different ones there. Um, and some of those are obviously like shelters and amphitheaters. There's a lot of different types of events and things that go on there. And, um, you know, mm -hmm. farmer's markets happen in amphitheaters. And there's a lot of different things that those are used for. But I'm just kind of curious what those things are. So it looks like everybody's voting. We've got a, got a lot of uh, people here um, mm -hmm. voting for different things. So we will give it three, two, one. Rec centers, a lot of things happening at rec centers. So certainly multiple use and that type of a thing. Um, some of our folks are saying we have most of these items open. So that's that's fabulous. I know there's a lot of progress and things like that. Um, at shelters, rec centers, um, some of the playgrounds, organized sports fields. So a lot of a lot of different choices there um, across uh, across the way. So there's there's how that all came out. And we're going to add one more poll question. Yeah, rec centers, boy, they're they're really people are anxious to get back indoors. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, so part two, which of the following would you say are the top concerns of your staff? Is it morale, training, dealing with enforcement issues, COVID safety, CEU opportunities, overall economy, getting vaccinated, hazard pay during COVID? personal issues like health, anxiety, family issues, taking care of someone at home with COVID or something else. And if it's something else, um, we would love it if you would write that in the Q&A so that we can share some of that with, uh, with the audience today. So again, some, some pretty heavy voting going on. We'll give you guys a few minutes here. This is a tough one because there's a lot of different, uh, different things that are concerns and so many things to be worried about. Um, you know, it's, it's a tough time and, and uh, I know everybody's dealing with it in, in very positive ways. Um, so we just kind of wanted to ask that question. All right, we'll give it three, two, one and end the poll and share the results. COVID safety, obviously top of mind. Um, morale, certainly we are hearing that from a lot of people as they're just, you know, getting tired and having to deal with things that um, they're not always trained to deal with, to be quite honest. Um, personal health, anxiety, and family issues um, is another one uh, that, that ranked very highly there. So those are, those are definitely our, our top three. So thank you guys for taking, uh, taking part in the polls. As you know, we, uh, we use the polls. We use a lot of the information that we get from our audience in shaping future shows. So we always appreciate you taking the time um, to do that. And don't forget to use our Q&A area to ask questions that you might have um, for our folks later. All right, Jody, back to you. Absolutely. Um, question number three, gentlemen. Technology is now a necessity as a key component of every department's operation and the marketing and communication with the everyday park user. 
Some of the brightest minds in the field are now suggesting that Wi-Fi connection be a part of the city county utility system and, and offered as a general public service. This movement is also a part of encouraging equity offerings throughout the country's communities, no matter where you live. Over the last few years, offering Wi-Fi services and some restrictions to park users has also been added to facilities, parks, et cetera. With that said, do you offer Wi-Fi in your, to your general park user? And if yes, where? And then uh, part number two for you. What technology is missing or being developed in the near future that will help the departments of all sizes? That would help departments nationwide in planning, data collection, monitoring of the park usage and marketing. We have a twofold question there, but we're coming to you as bright leaders and bright minds leading our country and some of the best park systems. Bob, please start us off with this one. I get the bright leader, bright mind question right out of the <laughs> You know, um, here's what I would say. I'd say we're doing probably a pretty decent job with it all. Uh, a lot of room for improvement um, on the outdoors aspect and in our parks themselves. Mm -hmm. I think indoors with our facilities, our recreation, uh, our family centers, tennis facility, um, ice park. I think we do a pretty good job with Wi-Fi capabilities, um, trying to let the public have access, but still, again, you know, internal controls and making sure we've got firewalls and all the necessary um, uh, protocols for our affiliation with our city IS department. It's really important, but I think the part about uh, having Wi-Fi capability out in our parks is our next step. We're talking about it right now. We've got some real direct applications for a sprinkle of a, gar a botanical gardens facility and the importance of that just from an educational perspective and what am I looking at and those kinds of issues. Next step would be our Dickerson Park Zoo and having that capability there as well. Um, even our, our main downtown park, Jordan Valley Park, um, as well as some of our historic park settings. Even what I mentioned before with our African American Heritage Trail kind of component or any of our trails, just to know what you're looking at and being able to relate back to the history involved um, I'd like to have it a little more prevalent even on our golf courses, just some of the tech issues we have going on there too. We're talking through that and just like with everybody else, it's a huge cost issue. Uh, one thing that I, I think is advantageous to us here in Springfield is we have a locally owned utility company, City Utilities, affiliated with the City of Springfield. And they're right now laying enough fiber optic that over the next two, three years, I think we're gonna have it continue completely covered. City Utilities is also a big proponent of our park system. We have three of our public parks on CU property. We're already starting those discussions with them about just how to maximize that technology to benefit our park patrons and folks that are, you know, that are coming into our facilities. I think it's really important um, in terms of looking at it a little bit differently. And I mentioned the part about just the historical aspect, the educational pieces, but I look at it a little bit differently in terms of what we could gain in terms of focus groups, um, things that aren't quite right about the park, improvements that our patrons would like to see. It's sort of that conversation back and forth that we have a lot of that going already. We have it with you know, Facebook and our websites and, uh, you know, and, and streaming, but it would be nice to be able to have that sort of real-time communication back from the folks actually in the park. And I look at it like, you want focus group information, ask the people in the park. And I think if we're able to get a little bit more tech literate and just put it out there in a community, offers us some real advantages in moving forward that way. Uh, that's a great idea, Bob. I think real time, again, they're in the park, they shoot you some information, that would be so helpful. And Jody, how much money they're spending. We all want economic data. We all want to make analogies about economic impact of our park system. Boy, it would be great to ask them that those kind of questions and have that feedback in real time as well. Absolutely. Mitchell, New York. Well, first, let me preface by saying New York did something very clever. <clears throat> and we repurposed a lot of our own phone booths. Do you remember those? And yes. so we have these kiosks in wide called Link NYC. So a lot of the public streets are covered, which are close to parks. Parks specifically, we have over 200 Wi-Fi sites in 120 parks in every borough throughout the city. Fantastic. Uh, so that's through Altis, Spectrum, and AT&T. They're great partners. 
And then we have some of our conservancy parks, uh, Union Square, Bryant Park. They also have Wi-Fi capabilities. You know, there was a study some years ago, a gentleman, a professor at the University of Pennsylvania was studying how people use Bryant Park and how they moved their chairs, they customized it, there were two people. And over time you notice it's now just one person with this device spending time by themselves. And so we understand how people wanna just go to a park, relax, not be there with anyone, but just look at their phone and catch up. Uh, but it's so important to be connected today. And so we're trying to expand as much as possible. So we have a pretty good footprint uh, of having uh, at least 120 parks um, have that Wi-Fi wi -Fi capability. We also have it in our uh, street network as well. In terms of technology, uh, this was rough going, staff now adjusted, but we have something called telematics on our fleet. Uh, it is basically a GPS device and it tracks all of our vehicles in real time. So for us, our packers are basically our garbage trucks. We've been able to better route where they're going uh, to be able to pick up more trash in our parks along the way, but also fuel efficiency and car emissions, truck emissions have been invaluable in running a very efficient park system, but also fleet utilization. I have 6,000 employees. And so we have a lot of vehicles out there. We can check the utilization of one division I see a 10% utility, we move it now to another division that wants a vehicle. So it helps us manage our fleet a lot better. It's called telematics. Even I have to wave my little key fob before I can start the car, <laughs> uh, but it allows us really to have a very efficient fleet. So that is an amazing technology. Wow. It's really helped us being more efficient in managing our park system. In terms of my wish list, park usage. We have so many parks. We have estimated we get 130 million visits to our parks. Some of our park partners like Central Park, you know, they can capture the 42 million, but we have a lot of smaller parks. We've tried something called Park Ford, which uses cell phone data. But for us, getting to know uh, if we improve a park is an increasing usage, usage. During COVID, have we seen an increase in usage? So to me, that's a piece of technology we would love to do in all of our parks so it can help us, like Bob was saying, you know, this now is getting more usership. We need to increase and improve this park because now it's become a more important destination. And so for me on my wish list, we're doing it now, but we use cell phone data. It is expensive uh, and it, we pass all the privacy tests, but to me determining park usage is something we're trying to ramp up on and do a lot better job so we can communicate to those decision makers. You know, we're getting 130 million visits. Uh, we need to figure out how to better care for these parks and shift resources for those parks that are getting a lot more visitors. You know, Mitchell, you hit on it. I mean, it seems number one with, I've heard it across so many webinars and so many trainings, that is the number one request. So whoever figures this out, we'll probably see them and we wanna make sure they're a donor in the future because they'll be very wealthy with that. Now the Highline has controlled entry, so they have people just clicking, but the Highline is a unique park that has an entrance and exit and you have to pass someone to get in. Most parks are not like that. That's right, and one beautiful park. Yes. One beautiful park. Homer, take us home on this one. Well, um, you know, for our local park system, the short answer is yes, you know, we do have Wi-Fi. Uh, it certainly is not uh, in all the places that we would like it. Um, so for example, you know, I mentioned, I may mention earlier, I think we have 30 facilities. So two thirds of them have that Wi-Fi uh, capability and it's really been critical during the pandemic. So, you know, like many other park systems locally, the ones that we do have open, it's been um, available to students who mm -hmm. uh, are not in school, but the parents don't have the, the luxury of working from home. So we've created a safe space for a child to come and conduct wow. their school day, but what really made that possible was the Wi-Fi, right? Without that, I don't know. I mean, you don't know what the impact would be. Would they be latch, latch key children? Would the parents have to quit work? We, we don't know. So I don't want to speculate, but that's certainly the value. Um, and the good news is we're in, we have it in two thirds of our facilities. Um, but beyond that, we also have, um, and, and we have this little bit of philosophical balance or conversation. And it's like, well, you want to be outdoors. You want to be in a park and not tethered to a, a device. But True. then you have others that believe where anywhere you should go with our uh, information, the, you know, the world that we live in today of 24 seven information, you need to have it. 
So, you know, what we look at is making sure that we're balancing where we've got Wi-Fi in our public green spaces with active and passive use. And so we have, uh, in addition to those 20 uh, centers that have it, we also have uh, 10 additional park locations around high use areas that we focused and made the investment because, you know, we've heard uh, Bob and, and Mitchell say, at the end of the day, it's all a function of the dollar, right? What can we afford to do? So those are considerations that uh, we will go through when we look at how mm -hmm. we expand it. Now here locally, you know, we have the benefit, we have an office of innovation that uh, really is helping in, as much as possible, right? Because we're, it goes beyond just the parks department, but this is about good news in parks. You know, we have uh, a central, um, I guess, office in the city that's taking an enterprise approach to helping close the digital divide. Good news is that is certainly a policy issue that uh, our local elected officials have gotten behind. Uh, and, and that's like that in, in many other municipalities. So there's the effort there, there's the will. Now it's just about, you know, where, where do we do it? Where does it make sense? Uh, and let me give you some examples. Again, we're talking about just parks. So, you know, one question that we're trying to chase down now, it is not uncommon to have a library directly adjacent to a park and or in the campus, if you will, of the park. And while the park may not have Wi-Fi, you know, most libraries do. So how do we extend that so that it gets beyond the facility into the green space? And I don't have an answer for that yet. I'm just trying to, in, in the greater scheme of connecting all the dots, where do we have other public investments that technically are not in my portfolio, but that I can leverage to try to extend that? And so that's just another approach and avenue to try to you know, bring together and, 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 and build the synergy around those, the, just those public investments. Um, from the needs perspective, uh, I think you know, Mitchell hit it right on the head. I mean, public usage and Visitorship is something we get asked a lot. We've had local universities come in and try to put together a formula that then you could take and expand. Um, that's a hard one. And, and that has not gotten off the ground. We have trail counters. Uh, and so in, at, when we think about our trail system, uh, we have more than 80 miles of trail that are designed to bring you around the city of San Antonio. They don't all connect yet. And focused on those 80, because we have a lot more trail miles not built, having trail counters at three locations in one year, we had over, um, a, right, at, right at about three, just shy of 375,000 um, hits on that marker on that trail location. Separate from that, we, we have a manual process. People come into a rec center, they sign in. I look at my rosters, I have over in a non-pandemic year, well over 550,000 wow. uh, people coming to our rec centers. You add those two together, undoubtedly, well, we are well north of 1 million, but it's having to take all these different pieces to just put it together. And I think, um, that would be the best thing that we could, I think, strive for and um, nationally, and it's scalable, right? So that is something that's needed regardless of how big or small your park system is. So right now we look to these different ways to, to put the pieces of the puzzle together and, and have that bigger story to tell. So I'll, I'll leave it there, but um, those are just some things that we're working on locally. Well, that's wonderful because again, you're gonna, it doesn't matter the size community. This can, this can help any size community, any size department. Um, I want to give a shout out to Jane Miller, who's bringing forward this idea of putting forward the Wi Fi as part of public utility. We will see what if it gains traction and how that might work out because that really could help all, all of the public spaces, but really help. Um, even the smallest community, if that could be done in all of our families throughout our, our country. Okay, Jim, wow, a lot of information. This is fantastic. Everyone, keep taking notes out there. I know, I know you are. Um, let's turn one of our favorite 
spots and, and times of our show. And Anne Marie, I'm going to hand it over to you and let's recognize some departments and also individuals that have gone way beyond the call of duty. Absolutely. Let's do it. And we, uh, we actually have several questions that we'll get to you after this um, on Wi-Fi. Lots of comments and questions from the audience on that. And then also a question about using um, uh, your rec facilities for religious services. So we'll get to those in just a second. Right now, this is called Good News in Parks about great people. Um, and we love this. This is where we give our panelists an opportunity to talk about uh, some of the great people that they work with. Um, and uh, just take a few minutes to, to honor them for what they do. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, Homer, I think yours is first. Oh, let me go back to that. There we go. Oh, you're muted, Homer. There we go. Hey, yes, thank you for the opportunity to highlight uh, a couple of wonderful stories I wanna tell. So in the bottom left, we see Trader's Village. And let me set the stage. Uh, this was April 9th, uh, 2020, still very much in the early uh, days of the pandemic. And there was a stay home order in place. Uh, it was a council day. And right when council uh, business agenda ended, a phone call came in that, hey, there is a need for uh, people to assist the San Antonio Food Bank with food distribution at Traders Village. By its name, Traders Village is just that. It's a, it's a place for local vendors to show off their product and um, just build community really. Well, it's large. And so this was a designated food pickup location for the community to come and pick up free food uh, at the, the, the hands of the food bank. They were leading this effort. Food bank calls um, the, the city and says, we need help. There were thousands and thousands of cars that showed up and there was just long lines and not enough people to get the food out quickly. So uh, we had two dozen within an hour, had two dozen um, staff show up at Traders Village to uh, help distribute food. And so in red is a leader of that group. They were primarily our recreational division. We have recreation services and park operation services. This is primarily recreation services. Lynn Kinton there uh, in red, um, just a great leader for that bunch. And there's several others there that uh, responded to the call. And you know, Lynn and just the whole rec team, they don't ask, well, do you know what I'm doing? Uh, you're interrupting my day. It's, yeah, we need to do this. And they mobilized quickly and provided that relief. Um, and then in the other two images, it's really an extension of connecting the community to, to food. Food insecurity is a, a local issue like it is in many places. And it is a priority for us in the Parks Department, the City of San Antonio and City Council. So there's alignment there. Meredith Tilly, uh, is pictured here, and she is uh, the manager over our park stewardship division. So uh, handles a lot of our volunteer coordination type projects. But the call for action here was, how do we extend food services to the community? This is um, during our summer youth program. And um, this was really an all hands on deck approach. Normally, this food program is really handled by our recreational team. But you know, we made the decision in working with my executive team, we really need to extend and maximize this opportunity. So top to bottom, every division participated in this effort. Meredith, I tell her many times, people know who she is more than they know who I am because <laughs> she's out in the community so much connecting um, people to parks in a positive way, promoting healthy behaviors and the things that we wanna see in our parks. Well, the focus was food. And so uh, Meredith was front and center. You see that, you know, we, our outreach is in both English and Spanish, uh, but this is just a couple of examples of how we really stepped up as an organization. Our rec team led by Lynn, uh, Meredith leading her park stewardship team to make sure we maximize the number of, of meals to the community. And I will end with this. So our state association 
is the Texas Recreational Park Society. And uh, we applied for an, an award basically for extending food service to the community in the context of our summer food program. And um, in that program, we distributed more than 111,000 meals uh, at more than, or at three dozen locations. And so next month, uh, we did, we'll be recognized and we will, we will receive the Administration Management Excellence Award for this uh, program. So it was certainly a positive experience for everyone, certainly a team builder, because when you take an all hands on deck approach, you have people uh, pulling together for a common bond, a common reason, goal, and you, they build those new bonds. So it was a great experience. We have a wonderful staff and certainly wish we could highlight them all, but uh, these are a couple of key ones that are, have really uh, contributed to our park system here during the pandemic. That is awesome, and congratulations on that. I mean, just the, not just mobilizing the food, but mm -hmm. people to get it out. And I, I have to say, I love that picture of Meredith on the right, because you can really, you can see even with her mask on that she's smiling and she's just having a great yes, time out yes. there. That's, uh, that's absolutely great. All right, Bob, on to you. Thanks, Anne Marie. Um, Homer, great initiative, hats off, so cool. And just wanted to mention Anne Marie and Jody, um, just what a program like this means, the sponsorship from Playcore Game Time to put good news out there. And that's kind of my message, I guess, if you will, is we've never needed good news more than we have during this uh, past 10 months and during a pandemic. You know, it's tough to give a shout out to any one employee group because I think back on just how hard and how tenacious everybody has been throughout this thing from the folks keeping our parks open with our park operations staff to again, our golf staff keeping those open to our school park area, trying to keep day camps going in the midst of a pandemic and things like that. But the group um, I really wanted to highlight is what we call our park board communications team. And that group is led by Jenny Edwards, our public administration administrator you see up there looking splendorous in her kayak there. And that whole group, because what they have done in terms of dealing with communication in real time has been nothing short than, uh, of amazing. And that's been our number one thing is to communicate with our patrons, with our partner groups and organizations to get the word out. Um, but while we're doing that, and most of it was regulatory and it was about what COVID meant and the facilities that were going to be closed. And she'll mention the need for signage and, and you know, just turnaround time and just crazy fast. And this group has been up to that challenge. And I, and I really do appreciate that. Along with Jenny, um, I have Diana Tindall, our marketing and sponsorship coordinator, Brittany Bywater, um, who's our graphic production assistant, Kara Remington, who's um, kind of our website extraordinary, helps us out with some of our uh, social media. And then more recently here, Charity Keneally. This group has really done a great job of communicating with folks in real time in our community. And again, I would just say the speed in which we had to do that has been like nothing we've ever experienced. I know there was a three day period in probably one of my uh, least favorite times in our park industry where we closed our playgrounds, followed by closing our family centers, closed, followed by closing our zoo. And those were back to back to back days. And so the need to communicate and get that word out was just as paramount as, 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 as you can think. Um, but along with that, and the thing that I really think um, kind of stood us a little bit apart was that this idea about good news. We took our own approach and within a week's time of the pandemic getting, we were like, we need to balance out all of this bad news and the things we're about to close down with some good news. And we, we developed an initiative called our Parks Pick Me Up Initiative that we have on our website and we have online. And it's, again, just a, a potpourri of testimonials, things you can do in spite of a pandemic, opportunities to learn within the park system, some that were online, some in person, just a whole host of uh, just different activities and ways of thinking, even while we're dealing with this incredible global health crisis. So I appreciate this group and their responsiveness to doing that. Um, it's been fantastic. You know, the group has also um, really worked hard to put all of our materials online, and that's been a very fluid process with keeping that information updated and answering Facebook inquiries and everything else. But our communication team has really been uh, rock stars that way, and I appreciate them. And frankly, I appreciate all of our employees with just um, the stick to it and it, that gets you through something like that. We're, we're kind of wired that way as park professionals, anyhow. But boy, you talk about everybody sticks you know, to set their game up even further. You do all that to get to an event and a special activity, but 
boy, can you do it for 10 months? And that's been a challenge. But I think our, our park board staff, by and large, has really uh, performed exemplary that way. Well, that's awesome. And congratulations. And communication is certainly so important. And, you know, you're right about the speed. All of a sudden, everything has to be quick. Um, decisions are made quickly and, and the word has to get out quickly. So that's great. Congratulations to that team. All right, Mitchell, take us home. Well, uh, I decided to look into our annual awards. We have this, we have monthly employee of the month, and then we have the annual awards of just like the Academy Awards for New York City Parks. So I want to recognize uh, both a person and then a team. On the lower right-hand corner, uh, we actually had our 40th anniversary of our urban park rangers. They were created 40 years ago. And Jody, you would actually enjoy the story. Gordon Davis, a very clever man, was at the US Open and realized how the police were down there after games and wanted to pick parks to be front and center, came up with the Urban Park Ranger program. They were now front and center as part of the US Open where everybody can see who are these people in these green uniforms. Love it. But now 40 years later, uh, there are peace officers, they do education, they do wildlife, uh, but through COVID, oh my goodness, they did social distance ambassador work, they helped distribute meals, uh, they were just there to support the public. And so they had a 40th anniversary event. And I cannot begin to tell you, it was like an alumni event of people from the past <laughs> coming out. Uh, so, you know, uh, Scarlett Johansson, her brother was an urban park ranger. And I got to meet Scarlett and talk about her brother and how he served during that time. But just a great story, great co contribution over 40 years, but particularly now during COVID. They're just outstanding individuals, uh, men and women serving this city, uh, but particularly a time of COVID and even Black Lives Matter when they were out there when there was a lot of disruption uh, in our parks. So just want to recognize the Urban Park Rangers uh, for their outstanding work. And then an individual, Karina Smith. Uh, she is the Chief of Staff for our Community Outreach and Partnership Development. Karina is a special individual, as you can tell just by her picture. She's a person who walk in her office. I just feel good just seeing her. She doesn't have to even open up her mouth. She has that presence and that demeanor that just makes me feel like I'm coming home to church. The minute I see her, I feel good. But Karina really did a couple of things that is so noteworthy. Uh, she was recognized as one of the commissioners of, of the year award. Uh, she heads up the team that helped our volunteers, helped clean up our parks. As we saw park usage increase, we saw budget cuts and last staff decrease. And as a result, our parks did not look good this summer. Karina and her team really were able to reach out to our partnership folks and bring out a lot of volunteers to make sure they supplemented uh, the work in her parks to make them clean. What is even more moving about Karina is right after Black Lives Matter, uh, it, after the George Floyd death, a lot of our Black staff in particular were just demoralized. Uh, she and I held these reflection phone calls just for our staff to talk about how they feel. Uh, she continued to spearhead that effort uh, along with some other colleagues here in the agency. But through those phone calls, we decided we had to do something special. And on June 19th, we decided to take one of our parks in Brooklyn and rename it Juneteenth Grove. And it was opened up on Juneteenth. Uh, staff went out there, painted the benches. You see Karina painted the bench of the pan African colors of red, black, and green. And Karina also is part of a renaming effort. We're not just celebrating parks we renamed in the past, but now we're renaming other public spaces and Karina heads up that effort. Uh, we did about 10 on Black Solidarity Day, which is the day before election day. And now we're doing another round on Juneteenth of this year. So Karina, just an amazing person, volunteer with a heart of gold, really trying to do the right thing for New Yorkers and help share the Black experience. I would like just to call out and recognize Karina Smith. That is absolutely awesome. I, I got goosebumps when you were talking about a lot of that. That's just. It's so special. And it, it's so funny that you said that about, about her making you feel good, Mitchell, because I felt the same way when I opened her picture. I'm like, oh, well, she just looks like a really pleasant person. She kind of gives you that feeling. That's that's absolutely yeah. great. Well, she thank you, guys. Sing. She sang Whitney Houston, our holiday event, and everybody thought she sang <laughs> actually better than Whitney Houston. Oh, wow. that That is absolutely awesome. How amazing. Thank you all for sharing all of that. Um, and we do have some question and audience um, that uh, question and, and uh, questions from our audience for you guys to answer. Um, so the first one was from Irene and she was wondering if anybody out there um, is, is able to rent out their 
um, rec spaces for um, church rentals or, or religious services. A couple of, uh, I know Elizabeth from, from our audience said that um, she's expecting to do that at their parks um, to return around the 1st of March. Um, and then Rachel from Hartford County, Maryland also says they do rent out spaces for religious services. Um, they're also reopening in March and all outside groups will be required to submit a COVID safety plan for a prior, uh, approval prior to using the space. Um, so how is that working in, in your park jurisdictions? Are you able to do that or thinking of doing that um, moving forward? Nope, we're not allowing indoor events of that scale at this time. Okay. Whether it's for religious or anything, all right. of our indoor events, no activities. Right, right. In um, San Antonio, uh, there is the opportunity to do that, but only in facilities that you know we have open, which right now uh, it's few and they're being used for the purpose of uh, distance learning, if you will. So uh, as back, I mentioned the, the reopen plan um, that is part of it, but where we do see it happening is in our public green space. So I mentioned earlier, some of the youth and recreational sports, the reason that's allowed to occur is Governor Abbott has said in his order that uh, gatherings outdoors greater than 10 are prohibited, except for youth sports, adult, adult recreation sports, and worship services. There's other ex, uh, explicit exemptions, but for us, we have had events in our parks uh, that are allowed under the governor's order in outdoor space uh, and it, for worship services. So that's, that's the nuances. It's exempted in the governor's order. Okay. Okay. We do have that opportunity here in Springfield, Missouri. Uh, we're under kind of a 50% order right now, um, but we still, again, social distancing, masking, and mandatory masking and all that. I think uh, one of the advantages we have is we have, we're in the jurisdiction of our, again, our Springfield Green County Health Department. So we can kind of negotiate and work through some issues with our groups and organizations making that request. We're certainly willing to do that. Um, but again, hold into exactly the same standard we have. It's still our facility. It's still our outdoor space. So they have to follow all those rules and regulations. And uh, just gentle encouragement to do that. And that's kind of one of those things we had early on with some of our sports groups sort of uh, trying, not as hard as we would like. And for us to move forward with these, we need to know that, hey, um, that's gonna be a rock solid thing. Can't have any deviation on that. Can't allow anything happening in our park where somebody has the possibility of getting sick. Right, right, makes perfect sense. All right, and on the Wi-Fi, we, as I said, we had a lot of comments and questions. So some of the comments that we had, um, Joe in Houston says that the park department there partnered with the libraries to provide not only internet, but also computer access. Um, and that the libraries are kind of the central internet uh, location for the communities. Um, another comment, internet access needs to be provided to all of those in their communities. Just look at the success of Zoom. Great point. We didn't know what Zoom was last year. That's now right. Have a show on it, right? <laughs> uh, now it's part of every day. They've made uh, accessibility to communities for input much easier and makes attendance at board meetings uh, more efficient and that attendance is up at those. So those are all great points. Um, Lori at City of Albuquerque says they have free Wi-Fi in many of their spaces as well as outdoors and available availability is limited to specific um, time blocks. So questions for you. Um, do you maintain Wi-Fi password protected or open to park pa patrons? Um, has anyone uh, leveraged or considered smart transit infrastructure for Wi-Fi? And then I thought this was an interesting point also. Um, in Austin, they have questions about where does Wi-Fi go? There's a lot of people that are very, um, it's a sensitive question because they're strong and passionate about mm -hmm. recreation and nature-based environments. Um, and so dealing with that issue. So several questions thrown out to you. I'll let you guys just jump in and answer whichever ones you'd like. Well, in terms of uh, Wi-Fi, as I stated, we do have the Link NYC, so there is free Wi-Fi available in the streets. In parks in particular, one of our providers, if you're a, a subscriber, you get, you, get, you get it for free. If you're not a subscriber, it's about 30 minutes or an hour, and then it kicks you off. AT&T, they provide that service where it's just free. 
I don't know whether it's password protected or not. I guess it would be because that's the same thing that people want to do. Uh, so on that perspective, uh, we'd like to expand it more. Our parks are very large. You have to find a, a location to put it on. So that for us becomes a challenge. We're able to get better coverage usually on a building where we can, be, we can control it versus just on a pole out there in the park itself. So like I said, we have 120 parks where we have it, uh, but I'm not sure about the password protected. I assume it would be. Uh, because usually it's a warning when I'm in the airport, don't want to use it if I sense my security uh, could be compromised. In uh, San Antonio, it is not password protected, but users must accept terms and conditions. Um, and so it, it makes it you know, accessible, easy that way. Here in Springfield, we are password protected, which we provide to our users. Um, Mike, that guy's so sharp, he's texting me real answers in real time to some of these questions. <laughs> That's great. Shout out. Thank you so much for that. Um, That's great. We That's just need awesome. to give him some more resources. You know, it's amazing <laughs> that kind of thing. We just need to provide some more resources for that because that is that is the next, that is it. That's the frontier of it all. And if anything that a pandemic's taught us is just, boy, we need more in the way of public technology. Right, absolutely. Are any of you dealing with the issue of people who are sensitive about Wi-Fi going into nature spaces? And if so, how are you dealing with that? We are here in, in San Antonio and, and it just goes back to what um, is an appropriate use for that and where does it make sense? So back to um, our natural area spaces versus our urban parks and then those hybrid locations. That is just really more of a um, part of the discussion and dialogue when we make those decisions. And sometimes it's, well, where do people maybe tend to congregate in a park? So if I have a large regional park, maybe Wi-Fi isn't throughout, but it's at just particular locations, maybe at a pavilion or something where people are going to congregate, sit down, you know, have, um, you know, I have a picnic or what have you versus having it extend all the way out to the playground or you know things like that. So I think that's the back to the balance is where does it make sense? Park-wide, where people tend to congregate. Uh, and, and I think the other just critical note too is you know, back to Wi-Fi and its purpose, right? It's about access to information. Uh, and, and this is not system-wide, but we have digital kiosks. So I can think of a park right yeah. now. It is a natural area uh, park one of our hybrid parks. And so if you don't have uh, a phone or to, to connect to Wi-Fi, you can go to a kiosk and get critical need to know information. And there, and in those instances, Great idea. those yeah. are tailored to the area around it. You know, maybe where you want to go, I don't know, have lunch, what are some local eateries or vet clinics if you're at a dog park or whatever. So that's the other consideration is, um, filling the gap, right? You provide just an alternate form of access to information. Sure, sure, great. Quick question here for Mitchell. Is the Urban Park Ranger program a volunteer program? No, it is not a volunteer program. They're paid employees. Uh, and as I stated, they're primarily for education. They do outdoor wilderness training, lots and lots of programs. They are paid staff. They are officially peace officers. So they can enforce park rules and can arrest. We also have a parks enforced patrol that primarily uh, focuses on quality of life rules in our parks, but the rangers are also trained at the same academy. They are full-time paid employees. Great. All right. Thank you for that. Okay. We want to share some information um, with you about next week's show. Pardon me, next month's show. So we have a bit of a break now. Um, between uh, now and the next show, it will be March 11th at 1 p.m. Um, and we're excited for this one. It's titled Excitement for the Environment. So we're going to be talking about all things um, environment and environmental. And we'll have Elizabeth Kessler with us um, from Woodstock, Illinois, Kevin Kerwin, from Vero Beach, Florida, and Tara Gee from Roseville, California. So we do hope that you will join us for that show. You can see the registration link up there. That's the same link we use for all of the shows. Um, and you can sign up for this episode as well as all of the episodes throughout the entire season. Um, so we, we're trying to make it really easy for everybody. And with that, Jody, I'll let you take us out. Well, gentlemen, what a great day. What a great show and invaluable learning and information. 
I know it takes time to put this together and give your valuable time because you're so busy, but from the heart, from the heart, keep leading. We need you. We need you dearly. So back to you, Anne-Marie. All right. Everyone have All right. peace, stay safe, stay masked, and let's move forward and let's knock it out in this field. Absolutely. Thank you again, everybody, for your time, your knowledge. We appreciate you so, so much. Our panel, our audience, thank you for being here and we will see you next time. Thank you. See y'all. Take care. <laughs>